you know, maybe you just notice someone and say, hey, well, we're getting together and we're going to make a fire. We're going to clean up some area or plant some crops or go fix an erosion point or something like you want to come. And that way there's a purposeful connection and then the opportunity for communication to naturally occur on their terms once there's a level of trust built happens and that's where i see the quote therapeutic value even though it's like a natural therapeutic value of human beings coming together doing work in a positive direction we're here with mark Matzel de la flor and did i get that right mark yes sir you did Matzel de la flor and Mark is a is the CEO and founder of Guardian Grange. He also uh, and what bleh, they'll edit that out. He served as a Navy SEAL for how many years? Uh, seven years. Yep. Seven years. And after leaving the military, um, started Guardian Grange, which is about helping or bringing veterans into. Um, permaculture style land stewardship. And as Mark said, I think the first time we met, um, moving from weaponry to livery. Um, so Mark's got a lot to say on this topic and probably a lot of experience that he's that um, interesting experience and stories to bring to the table today. And it's really an honor to be here with you, Mark, today. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Likewise, it's uh, an honor to chat with you again. I always enjoy our conversations and the the open circle format you guys have. I really enjoy that and gain a lot from it and, and definitely uh, reflecting on, you know, incorporating that sort of uh, communication style into building out the, the human infrastructure of the guardian Grange and what I call the soil based economy. Cause at the end of the day, it's all about, the human connection and our ability to communicate effectively. And if we can do that, even when there's trials and struggles and confusion, it uh, can serve to actually strengthen us as opposed to break, break it down. So I, I appreciate how you um, show and practice your communication styles with groups, especially groups that are um, not necessarily, um, intimately connected or um, maybe the topic is kind of outside the box or on the fringe, you know, it definitely helps to have mm -hmm. those practices that you all incorporate or that I've seen that you incorporate. So I appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And we'll try to bring as much of that spirit into this conversation today. Um, and then starting with story, which is always where we like to start, because I don't know if you heard, you heard when we said this at one of our introductions, you know, opinions, I can disagree with your opinion, but it's really hard to disagree with your story because it's yours and vice versa. Yeah. So let's start there with your story. Um, you know, I think from what I see from your bio and, and a lot of our conversations, um, s serving the United States as a Navy SEAL is a big part of your story. Um, so I'd like to start with how you got into that and um, a little bit of the, the journey through that, that Kind of the parts that really inspired what you're doing now, uh, if you if you'd like to share that. Yeah, for sure. So um, the Navy SEAL journey began when I was a kid in high school or around that time. You know, high school, middle school, and you start thinking about, well, what are you going to do after high school, kid? You know, so I was like, hmm, do I want to go to college or what do I want to do? And um, I loved being outside in the woods. That's where I spent pretty much all of my childhood, you know, just running around in the woods, climbing trees, taking in the, the scenery. That's where I felt the most alive and connected and normal. And then when I'd go into school, it felt very like abnormal, even though I enjoyed some of the, you know, learning and, and uh, creative learning too. I enjoyed that, but a lot of the school felt, felt very stale. So it kind of drove me away from that more academic pursuit. You know, I kind of felt like, man, this 12, once this 12 years is up, that's my time to kind of break free and get out of this education process. Um, but I, I was very interested in quantum physics as a kid. And I studied, uh, I had a class that was about photonics and, uh, that was definitely 
an avenue that I was going to pursue if I didn't go into the military um, because it was just um, outside the boundaries of understanding of a lot of the science, right? It's very exploratory and observational. So I enjoyed that because there was, there was uh, less theories to guide your thinking and it was in the creation phase. But I ultimately decided to go into the military because I felt I could be outside a lot more and I didn't really know much about the military. You know, um, when I started having this, um, feeling this pull towards that area, um, I had a mil- I had an uncle who was in the military, he was in the Marines. So, um, I thought, well, maybe I'll go in the Marines. And then I started learning about other branches of service and special, programs and groups and learned about army rangers and special forces and then i started like actually really studying and taking in all the like what exists in the military that i could potentially go into and that's where i stumbled upon the navy seal path and it just spoke to me because it was very small units um in any environment you know in and out of uh, water, forests, jungles, deserts, wherever, wherever you needed to go, you had to be a student of the environment and, um, capable and working with, with small teams. And it definitely, um, I'm not, uh, I'm not a super awesome rule follower. You know, I don't, <laughs> I don't, um, I don't like fitting in the boxes necessarily, Um, Because if I see a better way to move, I like to move outside of that. So the unconventional warfare aspect of it also called out to me. And I decided to research everything I I could, found out you could enter in on a SEAL contract and get a guaranteed spot at BUDS as long as you pass their physical requirements. And then if you just kept going, you know, you you, um, had that clear path that shot at it. So that's what I ended up doing. Walked into the recruiter and told them, Hey, here's what I want to do. And of course they tried to convince you to do other stuff. Cause I think they get points for like staffing certain positions that are more successful rates. So, um, yeah, that's where it started. I'm already tracking a couple of themes here. One is the, you know, looking for the opportunities that are outside the box where you don't have to follow the rules, where you have to be adaptable, uh, where you have to um, integrate into the environment, be a student of the landscape. Mm -hmm. You know, all these things that I can kind of see from our conversations, you know, in permaculture and land stewardship. And even when we started this call today, you know, talking about um, having to bring people together to do things that are unconventional, right? Like raise money to buy a property to be able to create some, um, of soil, a soil-based economy. So that's really cool to hear that, hear that that story, that those threads started really early and that you carried them through an, an environment that at least from the outside doesn't seem like it really fits that, uh, doesn't fit those into that. Well, the box of having no box really. Um, but it sounds like Navy, the Navy SEAL teams are kind of where that, where that can happen, where you can be, where you're required to be really adaptable and uh and the structures aren't as clear from from what you've said in terms of team how the teams operate and um how you have to meet the circumstances and the situations that you're encountering is that right well this the structures are, are clear as far as um like personnel and uh like numerical organizational structures you know there's like eight people to a um squad and 16 to a platoon you know the the fire teams are four and buddy pairs are two. So like the, the number structure is there and the, the fundamental skill structure is there. So that's like the science part of it. And then the art part of it is like, well, okay, now you have all these skills and then here's mission objective, whatever that we're trying to fulfill from like your administrative higher up um, infrastructure. And then it basically gets left on our plate because we are the subject matter experts. We're the one that's the most highly trained and we're the ones who actually have to think, move and, uh, communicate on the ground very quickly because you're in life and death situations and you don't have time to, um, 
micromanage anything or to be micromanaged. Um, so it, it, it lends itself towards, uh, what I see is just the most natural organic way of team movement through, you know, in that state, it's wartime environment, but, um, you know, even, even doing something like a surveillance and recon reconnaissance, which is not necessarily wartime environment. Um, and, and it can directly apply to like, for instance, um, going out into the wilderness and observing, you know, um, natural damage or natural ecosystems and taking that back for, you know, education needs research or, um, what I do with it is, um, planning out regenerative community infrastructure. So the, um, yeah, the environment gave us like a, a structure that worked very well. And then the selection process filtered out the, the, what I call like, like heartedness, right. It's the, there's a, there's a, there's a direction of uh, spiritual energy going in a direct, going in one way that everyone is aware of. And then all of our minds that may think about things different, see things from different perspectives can be focused in that direction to accomplish a mission. So even like something as, as, uh, as seemingly not this way as like a house clearance, like attack, uh, attacking a target, you know, and you're moving through a structure and it requires very fast and fluid communication. That's some verbal, but mostly nonverbal, um, communication, especially as you get good, it's all nonverbal and it's going off of standard operating procedures, instincts, reading, reacting, and body language. So you really get tapped in as a organization to move through uh, basically like a maze, right? It's like this structure, there's doors, there's windows, there's obstacles and potential threats and potential friendlies, potential not threats, potential, you know, conflicts or like blue on blues um, to problem solve in a very fast moving environment where there's like gunfire explosions and whatever else may be. So yeah, it was, it was, um, it's, uh, it was very interesting and, um, valuable experience. And it gave me, uh, a lot to reflect on, you know, even moving out of that military environment, like, well, now I don't have that cause that doesn't exist in the, uh, so-called civilian world. Right. So it's, it's, uh, universities, corporations, you know, your traditional kind of stuff and then family dynamics. But, um, yeah, that, that really like tight knit team doesn't exist as I see it in a lot of areas. It's very it's, rare. So I, it's, it's a unique experience and ex that I try to incorporate that Buckminster Fuller kind of quote that I reference a lot is that you take the weaponry and convert it into livingry or take that energy and convert it so that's what i'm doing is taking that fundamental structure that has been proven battle tested works very well um but is really only focused towards war and to take that and repurpose it and retool it to help facilitate a more healthy environment and healthier communities and instill a lot of the values that we used in the teams to, um, show, right. To show like this way of existing beyond theoretical argumentation and debate, you know, it's like everyone has, mm -hmm. well, well, this way is going to be the best or that way is going to be the best. But it's like, well, if I can take eight people and, you know, go out over the seas, get wet and wet and cold in the ocean, come back like eight, 12 hours later, and the processes that we have instilled, for instance, like when we come back and now it's time to pack everything up, put everything away. Like we always start with the team gear first. So that'd be like the boats and engines and motors that everyone, all teams collectively use. And then their platoon gear, you know, so any other stuff. And then we take care of ourselves. So the focus is always like to take care, make sure everything else and everyone else is taken care of first before you take care of yourself. And that prevents, um, I guess you could say exploitation or even like a greedy mindset from popping up because if it does, it gets dealt with really fast because that is detrimental to 
you know, if you're, if you're out in a, a high conflict environment and someone's like, just wants to, is uncomfortable to the point that they're just wanting to take care of themselves and sacrifice the team or the mission. That's not, can't happen, you know, it wouldn't be responsible. So we really train that and instill a value system that is causing us to, um, be presently aware of the needs beyond ourself while also staying focused on like, Hey, we're here to do an objective. And yeah, I think there's a lot of value to that. Yeah, it definitely seems to be missing, um, in our world right now, and particularly, I think it gener probably every generation that said that about the younger generation. So I'll stop there. <laughs> uh, what were the other values that you feel like you've carried over from being on the teams to your current work? Um, so I'd say a big value is just recognizing the burdens that come along with like top down infrastructures where it's like the administrative weight in, is, is, stifling movement and progress as opposed to facilitating it and making it easier to accomplish the objective. And I, and I, I recognize that, you know, in the military, which is one of the reasons I started thinking about getting out. Cause originally I had not planned on getting out on seven years. I was going to do, you know, 20 and retire or whatever, like as much as I could. Um, cause like I said at the beginning, I didn't really want to go work in an office or, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do in the, uh, civilized or civilian world. So, um, when I started seeing that, I just looked at it everywhere else too. And I'm like, well, if it's in here and I thought I was kind of getting away from that in here, um, then it's, I don't know, that's a big, that's a big issue. And it's what I see, you know, when, um, even in a lot of environmental, so-called focused movements, it gets very bloated and top heavy. And like mm -hmm. the solutions are often very simple. And then the administrative infrastructure makes them appear very complicated because there's like <laughs> positions and jobs and roles tied to making it complicated. And that happens a lot in the government too. It's like, there's a position that exists. They have to justify their position. So they make process that should be like a to b now a to b to c to d to you know all these other steps and it's like uh to me it was just like why are we playing this game like we're kids who don't know any better when we're adults and we can just be honest and say like oh hey if we're trying to be the most effective at our mission or our job like hey if 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 the process is efficient enough that these steps aren't necessary. Let's not continue to take them or add even more. So yeah, I just started seeing that. And it's just like, that is very, that's going from the unconventional back into conventional, even though those words may not be the best describers, but it's, it's definitely not allowing the artistic um, creative capacity, which is what I call one of our human superpowers. You know, you have human capacity to create, to communicate and to collaborate. And if, if we're leveraging those fully, then pretty awesome stuff can happen, you know? And if, if some of those, you know, if communications broke down, you know, you can have some awesome creators, you know, um, but there's no collaboration going on, you know? And if, if creation isn't happening, you can have a whole lot of communication about, the weather, you know, sports or something that's like very cyclical and repetitive, but you're not going to have a lot of innovation or problem solving. And that's just, I just kind of got um, jaded on seeing um, problems that would come up and be like, Oh, there's solutions like right here. And there's a, there's a, a energy, like a positive energy like whoa let's solve this problem and then it's like oh well no 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 let's wait and let's hold off and let's do all these other steps and by that time you're like what was i thinking about like i don't even know or <laughs> it's like the time window is is gone or shifted or you have to do all this extra stuff that is taking your energy away from the task at hand you know it's like if we want to build up the soil in an environment there's some very simple steps to take. You increase the organic matter. You make sure that water is moving through and you start 
planting seeds, which doesn't require a lot of um, money or technology necessarily. You know, if if there's the 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 will to do it, of course, like in the world we live, money definitely helps facilitate certain things like the acquisition of seeds or land or whatever um, to to make stuff happen. But just at the very most basic fundamental human level, um, none of those things are necessary to, to actually build up and, um, nurture the living capital that exists. You know, we kind of get caught up again in the financial capital, which is an administrative idea. It's an administrative concept of, of, uh, moving energy or, um, quantifying, value and we say hey these prices now this land is worth this much and this crop is worth this and your human interaction over here is worth this and it becomes very like number oriented and divorced from just like you know um part centered emotionally connected awareness that i think leads to a lot of the issues in society from anxiety to depression or in the military there's the pts you know sometimes they throw a d on the end of that which i think is not correct because um it describes post-traumatic stress as an abnormal reaction to a you know a wild unexpected environment or set of conditions and it's actually a very normal reaction and i think that places a stigma on people to not want to address the stress and that has led to um you know way too many suicides in the veteran community and it's it's often looked at like as um something that's not like oh we don't really know why it exists so we're going to take this pill that we made that's magic and it's going to suppress your uh, emotive capacity to feel where the pain is coming from and that that numbness doesn't actually help anything out. You know, it, it may like prevent something or delay something, but eventually that pain or that root cause is still going to be there. And so, you know, I look at all of these things from an unconventional perspective because I mean, my opinion is if the conventional perspective worked, then it would be working and we wouldn't have like an increasing number of suicides or even, um, you know, treatments that, supposedly help it's like all of it shouldn't be going up at the same time because it can't possibly be doing what it's told and you know i've had a um there's a documentary done on uh my buddy guzo who had uh killed himself and i was roommates with him and it was very well done um but it's like that was probably a definitely a formative event where I just checked out again. I was like, after the military happened, I was going to school and university, San Diego state. And when he <clears throat> did that, then I just kind of was like, what the fuck's the point of uh, all this stuff that we're doing when like someone who's sacrificed so much of themselves doesn't have true uh, people at their back as far as from the same system that was served obviously there's friends you know it's us but we're like uh, to, to some degree blind leading the blind when we're in a point of unawareness of what we're dealing with now when we have awareness of it it's different and that's why again I was kind of doing what I'm doing is because I recognize that the theoretical um, realms and debates just lead to more confusion a lot of opinions and a lot of those opinions come from like outside looking in like oh here's how i can fix this person or this symptom or this disease as opposed to empowering the individuals to be like hey here's what you're dealing with here's why it's perfectly normal response to some pretty crazy stuff that you experienced and kind of like we did before, like, Hey, here's the, here's the issue. How do you deal with it? How do you process it? And that's for me, I, re I had this, uh, epiphany going back to my childhood and it's like, well, nature is where I'm just tapped right in, whether it's hunting or hiking, 
you know, climbing a tree, sitting around, looking at a leaf, looking at the sun, like whatever it is that like the natural world and the, the, the organized beauty of it, of life is healing, especially when you have a purpose connected to that. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's, that's, I guess I'll end my tangent there for now. <laughs> like I said, no tangents. That was, that was really powerful. Um, I'm t- looking at Miriam cause I'm sure you got a good question or something to point out for. Um, I have so many questions. I'm so curious about many things. And the the thread that's really standing out to me, you didn't say disorder, but that was the D. Um, and this thread starting from phototonics through to kind of the organised beauty of nature and the way you described organization throughout your story, it was like a really strong theme of how things are organized. And when it's, uh, from your view, disordered or ordered, and I had this kind of thing of like right order that came in. I'm not quite sure what that means, <laughs> right order, but it was it was the thing that came in. It's like, what is it when, and, and it, it felt in your story experiential like an experience, an experience of right order when things, um, and, and you didn't say this explicitly, but when things would flow mm-hmm. and when communication, collaboration, creativity are present. And, um, and very obvious when it didn't, wasn't there. And a kind of like a searching for what made it go into disorder. <laughs> And an yeah. acknowledgement that what sometimes people call disorder is simply not naming the things in the culture that are disordered, I think is what I, what I was thinking about. And I wondered about, um, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but I wondered in your time, and this, is, this, is a misunder- this might be a misunderstanding from, from my part, so if, it's, if it is then other people might have it. But in your time of service, I always kind of like think of that time of service like you're in one reality and then you step out when you leave service and you step into another. Civilian life is what you called it, another reality. Is that the experience of like stepping into one order and into another? What's yeah, that? It, what is that? Yeah, I'd say it's stepping into layers of reality like there's one core reality beyond our language right the description the words we put to things and the ideas and the beliefs that we have there's you know that's why like nature you go out and it's just it is what it is without any conditions put upon it but then when you come into the 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 world of um ego let's just call it right it's like there's there's these different layers that are perhaps further away from that reality not to say that you're ever completely disconnected because we can't be but you could definitely be in a a very um siloed way of of thinking uh about like what this reality is that we live in and so when i was in the military it the reality is like you know physical presence and mind. So you're very connected to your body and your mind because you have to be physically fit, act, athletic, active, um, and mentally sharp and quick to, to problem solve. But your emotions are put down to the, to the back because they don't serve you well or could even cloud your, um, your awareness, you know, in a time, like if you get emotional in a firefight or something, that's not the time for it because it's everything has to be very calculated and, and quick. It's like a, a point of crisis or um, trauma, right? It's it, not necessarily like when you're going through it, it's the, you know, that word trauma doesn't mean that um, you're not potentially like you're in a state of distress necessarily, right? Cause a lot of times it's, we're in that flow. So it's, we're actually, in, I describe it as like, even in war, I was in, a state of peace, right? Because I knew the environment is chaotic, but it's like my movement through the environment and our movement through the environment was 
um, known. It's kind of, you know, you, you put water on a pegboard and it's going to move how it's going to move. And kind of these blockages that show up could be the disorder that you're talking about where it's like now the water can't flow. So it stopped or it stagnates and then it has to consciously figure out a way around that. So moving from like that kind of environment into the, the real world, right. Or whatever the next layer of the real world or the civilian layer, right. Um, there's a lot more emotional energy and which is not necessarily a bad thing, but when the emotional energy is divorced from perhaps like, um, mental clarity, it doesn't necessarily serve, um, I don't know if I want to say the highest purpose, but that's what I'll use for now. It doesn't necessarily serve that. So coming into that environment where people were much more um, emotionally communicative or moved emotionally without necessarily an awareness of why from our background, we turn that off basically. Like it was hard to connect to your average person, you know, which is not necessarily a good thing. Like there's advantages again in the reality that you're in in war to doing that. But when you get into the reality of relationships, you know, that's not good to have that disconnection. So now there's like the, the, the inverse when like a lot of guys come back from war or women, whatever it's like in now personal relationships, perhaps the inability to connect or the blockage, not the inability, because we're all able, but the the blockage there is creating now a, a a mental thought of like, well, am I not good enough? Like, what am I not normal? Am I this? And then there's reinforcing concepts that come out, and like something like PTSD, like, oh, you have a disorder, which means it's outside of your control, as opposed to you have a S, you have a stress, which is we have stresses all, all day long, all throughout our lives, you know, and the stresses can serve to make you stronger or um, teach you something. So if we're open to learning, if we're open to sit with the pain and the suffering that comes along with a stress, then that allows us to um, move beyond it, you know, or, or to, to pass on our experience to our children or to someone else in the community who doesn't necessarily have to go through the same trauma and through communication, we can say like, well, here is, here is where I've, here's some events that have happened or some state that I've been in and here's how I've moved through it. And here's how we've seen other, you know, friends stuck in it or think, feel that they were stuck in it and to check themselves out through the mechanism, physical mechanism of like suicide, whatever that may be. Cause that's a common theme that I've noticed from people who, um, survived or people who have left notes, you know, or just, um, um, kind of being aware of the, the, the general energy that goes along with it, you know, and I've met many, you know, friends who, who, clearly communicated like they've went into those states where they wanted to like they're right there on the edge and something pulled them away you know something what something happened in their life and experience that brought them into the the present core reality at the center of of everything because there's a there's a core truth or or what is true beyond like all these beliefs and um, ideas that we create. And that's why I, I try to keep myself in check. So I say it a lot. Like I don't have beliefs. I have awareness of, I know some stuff and I also am aware that I don't know some more stuff, right? A lot of stuff I, I don't know and I'm okay with that. So I don't have to believe in anything. I can just be at peace with what I know and what I don't know. And then like belief to me is like reserved for an energy of like, I believe in something. I believe in the mission. I can believe in the capacity of humans to do things and to become um, better versions of ourselves or to, you know, to, to not be um, restricted and boxed in and, and take on these 
identities that that are oftentimes like given to us, right? Like none of us invented PTSD. None of us invented that language. It's just like without that word being there, the same energy would, would be going on and would be dealt with. And a lot of, a lot of it comes from, um, the, the lack of communication. Like, even if you go back to like world war one and two, but when they had like shell shock, they called it, it's like, they always tried to slap a label on it to be like, well, here's the cause. So don't think any further of it. There's no more need for discussion. It just is what it is. So now how do we address these symptoms or how do we just like pretend they don't exist and abandon a whole population of people? And that could be the same as other forms of trauma from like any kind of, any kind of abuse or, you know, even like a natural disaster. Any, there's a lot of ways for people to have um, trauma that doesn't necessarily have malicious intent, but it's like, you know, the, the the quickness to like almost feel like i think a lot of it is people feel like they're helping you know if someone is metaphorically on a cliff right their cliff and they're scared of falling um it's like oh well we want to grab their hand and pick them up but it's like the next time they're on that cliff if they don't know how to pick themselves up that helping hand potentially could have set them up for um a worse for falling off the cliff. And, you know, it's like falling off the cliff in the most absolute terms could be like suicide, but falling off the cliff mm -hmm. in like a more of a training environment to use some language that doesn't necessarily fit, but it kind of does. It's like to, to fall off the cliff in a version of deep meditation or reflective thought or communication exercises. Like, Hey, here's like what happens if you, if you take your thought or, or, and let it go, like what happens if you let go of this thing you're hanging on to, that is like a belief that you feel like if you don't keep hanging on, you're going to die, right? You're going to fall down and die. But it's the reality is there's a ledge underneath you that you don't even see. So when you let go, boom, you're on the ground and then you realize, Oh, well I can let go of things sometimes, you know, sometimes that's the, the right answer. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll, I'll stop that one there. <laughs> well, the just two things, Adam, before I hand back to you. I I I really get that naming thing. Um and is is kind of like a it puts it in a box of a fixable problem. Um rather than something that might be unfixable in the way we think about fixable. Um and I and that that kind of led me to a reflection of grief. And I, you know, I hear, you know, a few times you've mentioned the growing number of suicides in the community. And um, I wonder about grief and, um, and how that is being expressed in, in the community of people who are losing people in a way like outside of the war and the service, you know, back in, what is, you know, theoretically meant to be safer territory almost. Yeah. Um, well, I feel like the, when those events happen, the trauma is shared, right? It's unloaded regardless. So like if it's, you know, if someone kills themselves, that trauma resonates through everyone who knows them. They feel it. They feel the pain, even though they don't understand it, they feel it. And so, um, in the times of calmness and, and peace, when we have the ability to communicate to whoever, to our friends or family, or just anyone listening that in those, in those times of, of trauma that, it, or, or intense emotion where it feels like it's never going to end, that energy has to be shared in some way. It will be shared in some way. So it's a, um, I'd say a, a, a more compassionate decision for you, not only yourself, but for your friends and family and, and people who absolutely do love you, even though you may not feel it to just to communicate it out, you know, or to commute. So it's, so it's now, you know, oftentimes it feels like, and I'm this way, like the sharing a burden with someone is not it's like not something I want to do. Like I don't want to give my stuff to someone else. 
However, if it's to the point where it's close to or too much for you to handle, or even before it gets there, it's good to openly communicate to someone. And oftentimes in like a a specific type of trauma, like war or someone could have sexual abuse or something, it's off. It's most likely helpful to talk to a peer because someone who has also shared a similar type of trauma, um, because then there is a, there's a, I don't know if credibility is the right word, but there's, there's definitely a, a level of trust. Like when I link up with a veteran, I know that I can communicate and listen and be heard or hear them. And they'll know like, Oh, well they'll feel at least like, Oh, well this person knows where I'm coming from so they can understand. Whereas if I was dealing with someone who had like a specific type of other trauma that I didn't go through, they may be saying like, well, what the hell does this guy know about anything? Like my pain is different than anything he could ever know. And so even though that's, you know, it's true and it isn't true. Like you can't know pain that you haven't gone, but we all know pain and we have all had our deepest, darkest moments. Right. So, um, is if we, if we've been down in the Valley at, to some degree, we can still recognize and empathize with someone who's also maybe down in the Valley at a point. And what I try to do is, um, when I've recognized that in other people, especially people that I don't know is, you know, at that point I can just be someone who's there to see them, to witness them, to say like, Hey man, I'm, I'm here. And to, to not try to analyze them or say, Hey, well, you know, if you do this, you know, this is really going to help out. I, I, sometimes I'll share like, Hey, you know, I've, I've, I've been in a similar state and here's kind of the things that I've done or, or maybe not even that direct. I'm like, you know, maybe you just notice someone and say, Hey, well, we're getting together and we're going to make a fire. We're going to clean up some, um, area or plant some crops or, you know, go, uh, fix an erosion point or something like you want to come. And that way there's a, there's a purposeful connection and then the opportunity for communication to naturally occur on their terms. Once there's a level of trust built happens. And that's where I see the quote, like therapeutic value, even though it's like a natural therapeutic value of human beings coming together, doing work in a positive direction, those conversations will naturally come out and that energy will be shared in a way that's healthy and not overwhelming as opposed to someone just like killing themselves or blowing up or being, you know, very mean to someone that they love. And then all of a sudden the relationship, you know, suffers or breaks. Um, the, the communication has to happen. That kind of goes back to like your superpower, right? It's like human superpower is communication, but that can also the inverse of that can be our kryptonite, you know, it's like, if there's no communication, that's, that can be a a very, a very lonely place. And in a lonely place, when we have a lot of ideas about what others may think or how we see ourselves, and we're not able to reflect and be like, Oh man, maybe it's like someone just really beating themselves up and no one's there to tell them like, Hey man, like that's actually no one. That's not don't that's you, even though you may feel like that, that's not how I feel about you. And I think you're pretty, awesome or whatever, like there's no point of, um, alternate perspective in a state of isolation. And that's why, um, I think the, the team environment is like the ultimate medicine, like the community, the people being together because it takes away or it lessens the feeling of isolation, even though it's for sure people can feel isolated amongst each other. But, um, you know, when there's no expectations put on someone for being present, it's just like, Hey, we want you to be here. You know, there's some stuff. If you want to help out, we value you. There's val there's now value there regardless of like, well, man, these people hate me. Well, regard, like, you know, if you're in that state, it's like, well, you're still valued. So maybe they don't hate you actually. And then you like a lot of these thoughts that are beating ourselves up or, you know, whatever they may be start to work themselves out. And I've seen it, you know, cross, um, communities too, where it's just like, we have different sets of trauma, but because we're still sitting, sharing, um, in work to move through suffering or to do something positive, trust forms, 
you know, across communities where it originally or otherwise it, it might be, you know, like, oh, well, if you look like this or if you think like this, you're not supposed to get along with someone who looks like this or thinks like this. So how do you, you can't theoretically argue your way out of it because it's like, don't think about pink elephants. So if you're, if you're like talking about them, they already exist. But if you now don't have the conversation and, but still share each other's space and company, the illusion, like you can be around someone um, and I'm, I'm sure it's happened. It's definitely happened in my life to me, from me, right? It's like where people are like, oh, I don't think I like this person maybe for some reason, like you just, whatever it is. And then as you are around someone, it's like, oh, well, I actually do like this person and they kind of like me. And that was just a thing in my head, you know, but the, it allows us to see each other as humans um, beyond the identity. So I like to get away from as much labels as possible. So I just say like, what am I? I'm just a man of, I know a man of multidimensional mystery, I like to say, because now it's ambiguous, right? <laughs> but um, it it has a meaning if you dig into it. And it the, the point of the, the point of the words I like to use too, is like, they're not necessarily defined and it forces someone to either examine it and come to their own conclusion, which is hopefully centered in the truth. That's why I use words like soil based economy, right? Because if you talk about, oh, well, we need to make these moves for this business or this economic decision, it's like, well, what's your econom economy based upon? Like, what are you, what is the ultimate ends that you're serving, even if you're not really reflecting on it? Like, where is it all just financial return? Is that like, you know, shareholder profits and all that stuff? Or is there something? deeper like what do those what do people do with the energy they receive in terms of money or what does a corporation do in, in its energy it receives with money is it just reinvesting this um this into this hamster wheel of price accumulation which actually doesn't affect the value because the value of the entire earth has always been the same right it's like life is life life is valuable one human being is worth just as much as another um, especially if you, you know, you get, you drop deeper out of the ego and just, now we're dealing with babies, you know, it's just like one baby is for sure just as valuable as the next. You can add all kinds of qualifications on that baby and call him a doctor or a whatever construction worker. It doesn't really matter. Um, at the end of the day, the human is a human. Um, and it's, it definitely gets tough at time to see to see that in this world, because, you know, we're just constantly inundated with like, well, if you're not this way, then you're not actually that valuable. Or if you don't have this much wealth, then what are you really doing with your life? Or if you haven't done X and Y, blah, blah, blah. So, um, not to, not to say that any of those things are inherently bad, but it's like the, when the tool becomes the, a master of the user, like that, that relationship is, is, is imbalanced there. And it's, it has no, there's, there's no way out of that, but to, to either like keep spiraling upwards or downwards, doesn't matter to this point where like you again, meet with reality. And this is where like, I think midlife crises has come from. Cause it's like, Oh, well I thought one way for so long. And now like everything is different or I lost my, you know, bank account and everything I worked for and my title is like, well, who am I now? I'm nobody or this or that. And it's like, I've been blessed and burdened, right. To, to have walked through life as a, as a loner for a big por portion of it. But from that, like I became very content in like actually never feeling alone because I always felt like the sun on my skin or the, even if it's cold, like there's the, uh, the natural environment is always there. So me, it's like, I always, my basic philosophy is like, well, I'll be happy sleeping in a bush. I don't, if I didn't have a house, I would still go to sleep in a bush and wake up and be happy and grateful that I'm breathing. And, you know, maybe I'll go fishing. I don't know. <laughs> it's like, you know, okay. Like if, if I, if I couldn't get a, a, a job, right. And I couldn't do any of those things. It's like, does, doesn't define me you know i can still walk into the forest climb a tree hunt and live off the grid you know <laughs> if i wanted to so that's a lot of my work is to like 
blur the artificial lines, right? Because na natural organizational structures and organisms don't have straight lines. They have structures and networks that are organically developed. And a lot of times, like the the ego is like, well, I want to shape this environment. I want to be the master of it to control it. And there's there's like a, a an inkling maybe of righteous pursuit in that, right? But it gets it gets lost when it's like you're abandoning all life that and that that existed before you and will exist after you and is allowing you to exist right now. So taking that into account of like, well, hey, I would like to do this, but how is it going to work within the environment that we are given so that it either doesn't degrade it and destroy it or that it actually enhances it. And that's regeneration, right? It's like there are, our cells naturally regenerate when conception happens and psh, cell division and multiplication, it's all psh, going from there. You know, that is a natural process. And then somewhere along that way, when you have so many cells and so many thoughts, you know, some of us start thinking like, Oh, well now everything is very, um, is very, uh, zero sum game or, or, um, you know, heading toward the heat death of the universe where everything's just actually dying, even though everything's living. It's like, that's a, that's a perception of, of, uh, of, I'd say it's an errored perception of, of looking at time and a life cycle of things, but not seeing the bigger, broader picture that sparks life in all things that is constantly regenerating and growing. So that kind of perspective and that energy is what I put into designing this infrastructure. And there's a, the disorder came up, right? Dis, disorder, right? So there's a book that I like and, uh, it's called anti-fragile and it's anti-fragile things that came from disorder. Right. So, and he talks a lot about there in natural structures and, in trees. And, um, you know, if, you know, a tree is stressed positively by wind, that tree is going to grow strong from it. So it is, there's, there's the stress or there's the disorder, you know, from a perfectly balanced, no wind, no environmental change, whatever, you know, a tree will still grow, but it's going to be a bit more fragile. And so I think um, even in the military going back, like seeing a lot of these architectures, these pyramid structures that are in every corporation, it's a pyramid, right? It's, it's, that is not an organic shape. And so we, pyramids are pretty cool. Like if you look at the physical ones in uh, South America or Egypt, like they're pretty amazing creations, but those civilizations don't exist. The trees do, the forests do, you know? <laughs> so I look at like, is that cool? Yes, but there, there is, is it uh, a wonderful monument? But I don't, I think I look at the wonders of the world and I see like, okay, well, the Amazon rainforest, like that's a nature and human collaboration. That's humans working as part of nature to create that thing that's living still beyond the people who helped create that. Same thing as the redwood forest, like those monumental trees only exist in that state because human beings were actively stewarding the land to allow for that growth. Whereas we see what happens in modern society when we're not man like doing, you know, cultural burns and managing the wild, the, the, the fires. And then you have a big fire that sweeps and trees can't grow very big in that environment. You know, if there's a massive wildfire every 50 years, when it takes hundreds and thousands of years for a tree to you know, gain the, the, the stature of a, of a massive redwood. And so I, I, that's where I look at, I look at the wisdom of, of that. And I call it, I like to contrast it like natural wisdom versus artificial intelligence, you know, where this idea that we're going to invent robots or program the mind of an ego into a computer that's now going to solve all these problems that have been solved that have been created by a lot of confused egos instead of like taking a step back and be like well maybe the path that we're chasing like this circular tail of logic eating itself is like if we step back and see that before we had all our great ideas and our grand complexities there was a whole or, or complications, right? There's a whole complex, but ele elegantly simple 
universe living and thriving before any of that. And um, that's where I'm trying to working to move awareness into like, we, we can do a lot more by doing a lot less. And doing it with more intention, you know, to, to it's, it's, it's good for a father to be a good father. Like that's good enough for like, you don't have to be like the best father on time magazine or wherever in the universe. It's just like, you just have to be a good person, a good brother, a good neighbor. And that positive energy is going to be felt just like when someone decides to kill themselves, that traumatic energy is felt in ripples effects. So we're dealing with, you know, energy frequency vibration, right? So if, if we're making the conscious decision, which is definitely tough at times, you know, there's a lot of stresses that come out, but if we're making little steps to be better in our own way, that is focused on you know, again, the team, the platoon, like thinking outside of ourselves, like even if I'm feeling like bad or cold, like I'm just cold, right? It's a physical feeling. Same could be an emotional feeling. I could be sad um, or I could be spiritually unfulfilled in a certain way, right? And I think filling those cups up happens by giving, you know, giving, being of service. And so by living living in a service oriented life, it doesn't mean you have to be sacrificing yourselves and in, in, in like, you know, just kind of, yeah, just giving all of yourself away. You still hold enough to maintain yourself, but you create now synergy where your positive interaction with others feeds them and feeds yourself. It's not a zero sum game and it's not a, it's not a, a world of entropy that we're in. Like these are, again, concepts that are very like material reductionist things of like, oh, well, if we look at the physical universe and our theories that we don't quite understand, go back to quantum physics. It's like, you don't really know anything, but you do know that like, if you give someone a hug, you're going to feel better, both of you, right? If you yell at someone, you're going to feel worse, both of you, or maybe one of you kind of feels better for a little bit of time, but probably not. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, that's where I don't know. It's, it's a, it's, it's tricky with language and I, so I like to write and I like to, um, but I've taken a long pause for it from it just cause I've been observing and reflecting again, you know, I was, I was writing for a minute and then, um, I stopped, um, not, not cause I'm going to keep stopping, but just cause it's, you know, taking that pause of point of reflection. And the one thing I, I, observe a lot is how often language really trips people up. You know, even if it's a miscommunication, like in a text, it's very easy to miscommunicate or on social media, you write things and someone's going to interpret it away. But when you speak with an energy, you know, or even if you have a presence without speaking, there's communication that happens um, beyond the words. And I think that again, going back to the administrative academic model where everything has been reduced materially to like, well, is there a study that dick that tells me I should think this way about something or that tells us I should move left when, you know, this event happens as opposed to like, you know, going back to the house runs. Like we often like have a, we have our standard operating procedures of like, Hey, when this door opens this way, you move this direction. However, if that something else happens or if the person just decides to go the other way, you flow and you go different. And now you're moving like water as opposed to, moving rigidly and forcing square pegs in the round holes or something when there's actually no square pegs or round holes to begin with. It's all, it's all like, you know, trees, root structures, branches, networks, mycelium, soil, water, and all of it is interconnected. And at the end of the day, like I like the analogy or the, the truth of like, we're all breathing one breath, you know, it's moving around the world and we're just, we're just sharing it around the trees are breathing it, the plants, the oceans. Um, so we're all, world dependent on that and that kind of breath that spirit that's moving through us is continuing that source engine of life that keeps sparking new life like there's new you know seedlings planting trees there's new children coming in like no matter what crazy chaos is going on in the world life is still 
showing its will to to be present and 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 try beyond all the bullshit that we're believing you know like the baby's coming in doesn't matter if they're coming into russia ukraine us you know africa wherever you know it doesn't matter they're coming with a pure life force energy and it's our responsibility as um as adults to say like hey um we got to work through our shit we got to work through our trauma and not pass it on in some ideology or belief or language or codified structure law whatever people want to say it's like dropping beyond the words and this is why like again nature is like you go into nature you you don't necessarily have to say anything not saying anything is a lot better right and then an awareness happens and when that point of awareness happens and people are kind of vibrating on the same frequency then the conversations that happen from there may be short or lengthy it doesn't really matter but they're going to be substantive and they're going to um allow for a space of sharing you know that uh, otherwise wouldn't happen like especially in my um military style again the emotional thing was caught off cut off like the heart center is blocked in a lot of guys right so sharing emotions is not very easy you know especially for probably men in general in society but dropping in together into a space whether it's around a fire or um you know camping or whatever or even like plant medicine in the right setting it allows the sharing of trauma in a positive way and it goes back to that ripple effect it's like are you going to share trauma with something very like powerfully destructive and hurtful and negative through you know whether that's again yelling at someone or killing oneself right that negative energy is going to be felt or are you going to positively release the pressure off the valve and allow um nature to do its magic you know then the natural process to unfold and to 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 heal the personal cultural um familial generational traumas that you know at the end of the day most of us probably nobody really asked for you know the trauma it just now we've been reacting to traumas from every direction <laughs> and it's like that that water on the pegboard is being blown with like a uh uh like a hair dryer or something like pushing us around as opposed to just letting us letting us allowing ourselves to flow so another tangent for you <laughs> i drew uh I, I drew a picture on my notes of uh of the drama triangle mm-hmm. you know the victim perpetrator rescuer yep and then i I took note of confused egos and I had this image of this whole conversation happening, confused egos, creating problems and then fixing them, creating problems and then fixing them, creating. And it kind of felt like reading Twitter, you know, opening yeah. a Twitter and feed and just like, what the fuck? <laughs> like a cycle that never stops. And then I felt, then I had an image of a, of another conversation that I know so many people are having that's not even interacting with that space like the one that you're having mm-hmm. with with the land with nature with veterans with uh non-veterans that you're interacting with and and that you're getting support from or supporting communities of um and you know those those conversations they don't even check out they don't even like it's like the confused egos and the and the drama triangle don't even register those conversations it's like another language yeah um not yet anyways right but it feels like those two worlds are getting further and further apart like the real world <laughs> and the confused ego world um and we don't have that much time left but I, I wanted to see you know how here how you're bringing all of that experience all of that thinking all of that no- wisdom that you're sharing how you're bringing that into guardian grange and what's what's happening there now um for yeah. you and what that's all about because i know yeah. you're i know you're talking to it but you know in, in everything that you're doing but how is that how are you living that out right now yeah so we're definitely very much in the the seed planting stage still right it's like a lot of these conversations 
um, don't help immediately necessarily, right? The awareness helps, but the, the action that, that is clear after an awareness happens, right? It's like the gray stuff, you start seeing the black and white and then the black and white, I say beyond black and white is clear, not gray, right? So with clarity, then we're moving intentionally to plant seeds. So we are working on a, like a micro grange, um, <coughs> excuse me, property, um, which is like a smaller scale fractal version or spoke to the hub of this infrastructure. So we're doing a lot of work, like improving the land, cleaning up, bringing people together, um, you know, forging the community aspect of this, like, all right, let's get everyone together. Here's and start talking about what this is about. And from those events, people started learning like, okay, I can see, I can feel where this is going. Cause a lot of military veterans don't even have uh, an understanding of permaculture and it's never, you know, why would it come up unless you sought it out or stumbled upon it? Um, so it's really like, show and tell, like bringing people into environments where we're living an aspect of it. And so right away, that's building, you know, cultural capital, social capital, right? We go into the permaculture forms of capital um, and we're working with living capital and material capital, cleaning things up. Um, now we're, we're moving into our next phase of acquiring a dedicated like farm headquarters is like to call it like um, a space where it is our own, right? It is not um, conflicted by any other ownership interests who have, you know, whatever else they want to do. Um, so setting that space up in order to operate programs for veterans to stay a bit longer in that community environment and programmatically like, you know, release um, or get outside of the chaotic environment and just be connected to a real tight community and start learning kind of this philosophy and this way of being and maybe even adding skills. Like for instance, our partner um, company is going after uh, acquiring contracts in demolition because it's like something where guys can make some money, you know, they can uh, feed their family with it, but also um, have space to be engaged with what we're doing. So whether it's, you know, getting guys employed on construction projects or moving into the, the more foundational work of building up infrastructure of the, of the soil based economy, that's kind of what we're doing. And up in Ojai, we have a project that we're working with meditation Mount to create a garden on their, uh, couple basically a couple acres of their land up there to be able to provide food to the schools so as part of that project like we're also you know working on a grant and i'm definitely not like you know i write but i'm not like a grant writer so like navigating that whole process has been um interesting and a lot of work and i've got you know some help from uh some people which makes uh, the work a little bit shorter but it's we're we're using all of the the avenues like how can we bring in financial capital to boost up the cultural experiential living capital you know that uh gets a a holistic return on investment right it's not like we're not we're not taking capital in to create more or financial capital to create more financial capital we're using our effort our energy our life force to create capital and other forms. And along the way, if we can pull in financial capital to boost that up, that's what we're going to do. And that's where I like, you know, over the past two years that we've been in existence during like this pretty chaotic time, we were able to just get work done with not a lot of financial capital whatsoever. And to me, that's perfect because it shows like the human capacity to show up and do work with is more powerful than an absence of financial capital, right? So now it's like taking what we have done and saying like, Hey, that was basically this phase. We're moving into this phase. So now I'm 
starting to make asks, which I haven't done before. Of like, yo, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to get this property in the middle of the woods and we got to make an all cash offer because you can't get financing for it. So now we, you know, we have a certain chunk of change that we can use, but now we need to acquire more, which means, okay, it's time for me to, you know, start tapping like community that is down to support impact investing maneuvers into, you know, to use that word, even though it's, you know, um, it's like everything you do, it has an impact. Every investment that you make has an impact, whether that's financial or your time or whatever. So it's just really tapping people into the conscious, the conscious collaborative movement to like start pouring water on these seeds. We've been planting seeds. The seeds are starting to sprout. Now we got to, you know, sprout. Now we got to add some water and, you know, give them some, some food, you know, um, to, to build this, um, forest environment. And I like to say that, uh, you know, there's the whole concept of the warrior in the garden. And my thing is like, all right, put the warriors in the food forest, like build the food forest and then bring in other people to, to see and participate with this process to ignite the warrior heart within each human being. And that warrior is not a soldier or combat. The warrior is like the one who is willing to fight for survival to, 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 nurture and to protect and defend what is naturally good in that fundamental reality that we're all a part of. So yeah, that's kind of where we're at right now. Cool, man. It, and I, you see, you've used this term, uh, soil based economy. I, I think I understand what it is. And, uh, and I have also, you know, it sounds like in, in a few of our conversations, you've talked about the sort of transformation, like, Guardian Grange is transforming that financial capital into into the soil based economy, right? Yeah. So think of uh, fundraising from the heart. Who is that author or that speaker, Miriam? Fundraising from the heart. Lynn Twist. Yeah, she talks about you know converting money from that would go into to warfare into uh, livingry. You know, mm. you know, she she doesn't use those words exactly. But what is the soil-based economy? Like, how would you define it for people that have never heard that term before? Yeah. So uh, the reason to use soil-based economy is because right now, if you say, well, what is the economy based on? It's oil, right? For pretty much, right? Mm -hmm. So it's oil-based economy, but that's not, it's not true, right? It's the, the oil allows energy infrastructure to be moved. However, the basis of life at the end of the day is soil, which is a collection of earth, water, organic material, right? So recognizing that, like, what is the actual lifeblood? What is the most important piece of the so-called economy or the environment, the ecology that we live within that is the soil? Because that is where all food comes from. That is where all life continues and is dependent upon, you know, the deer needs to eat stuff that's coming out of the soil just as much as the tree needs nutrients from the soil and the water needs a home in the soil to be saturated in the ground. Otherwise it runs off and you have a desert. So now when we look at that, like, okay, how can we improve the soil based economy? Well, if we have erosion points and water is not sticking on the land or it's not moving slowly, you know, it's like slow it down, sink it in, spread it out as kind of a permaculture um, model, if that's not happening now, we can use our creative capacity to be like, okay, well, this area could benefit from, you know, the, the, the economy of the soil here could benefit from having water stick around a bit more. And maybe we need to have put root structures in here. And, you know, that could perhaps be just spreading native plant seed, or if we're, you know, working on incorporating a food plot in there, then how do we grow food infrastructure in a balanced way in that environment. So everything is reflected upon that basis model in the soil based economy. And that's why I use that term because it forces the conversation to drop out of all the preconceived notion of what an economy is, right? Because again, the industrialized economy is very young. It hasn't existed for a long time. And again, before we got here, this whole economy or ecology environment existed and if we step into our role as stewards, as human beings, which I believe is our highest role to steward our bodies, our families, our communities, our, our natural environments, then we're naturally going to be taking care of it. But it 
takes us this um, step away from, you know, the train of thought that that we've been siphoned into thinking like, well, no, the economy is separate from nature. Man is separate from nature, which is uh, one of the major sources of a lot of confusion and <laughs> in, in trauma. You yeah. know, we're fighting it. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, it's that parallel reality. Like the one of our friends calls it the global casino. You know, the economy is basically a stock market, but the whole economy kind of rides and falls on that. Yeah. It's based on this global casino that's just off there somewhere and so disconnected from our daily life and our, da- our what we actually need as human beings. Um, so in every in every instance in this conversation, I feel like you brought us back down to earth. You know, right from the beginning. And I mean, us, me and Miriam here talking to you, but also everyone that's listening. So where do people, uh, if people want to, want to donate, want to convert some money from the, the, conf- the confused ego economy into yeah. the soil based economy and support veterans, uh, that have, you know, and this might be an unpopular thing to say for some people, but that have supported all the freedom and the, the economy that we all get to enjoy every day, the veterans that are out there and coming that have come back and, and want to be a part of the healing for all of us um how can they get involved how can they, they support you help yeah, you find gar- that land yeah guardiangrange.org is um the website and it's uh, g-r-a-n-g so grange um yeah that's where you can find us and on social media you know guardian grange is the at thing that usually finds us um but yeah we're we're putting stuff out there and um there's an email list at guardiangrange.org that people can join and we'll uh put information out there as well so yeah the, the there's, there's a, a donation donate. link on the site yeah up in the top right, on right. The top. yep yep cool cool well it's been super super great talking to you again yeah, Mark. you as well and, um we'll we'll get this this well i i was going to say something when this is about, over but yeah <laughs> i jumped to the post-closing Thank you, Mark. All good. Thank you. Thank <laughs> yeah. you, Adam and Miriam. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. I just want to say, um, I, I like, I want to show you my piece of paper. It's just like I have so, I have gathered so much wisdom. Nice. From I had so many questions. I had so many follow up questions too. So many yeah. more follow up questions. And um, I really, uh, you know, may this conversation continue because I also think in what you have learned through coming out of service and seeing civilian life is so valuable. Um, So thank you for sharing.